Many thanks for joining the Tuesday edition of Journalist Hangout. I'm Ayodili Uzubaku. Today on the program, U.S. President Trump comes under attack for allegedly calling Buhari lifeless after Washington meeting. Lawyers, others challenge Buhari on rule of law, remarks, and later on the show, Leia Sharibu speaks from Boko Haram's den, urges Buhari to secure her release. I'll be hanging out with Babajide Koladi Otitoju, Mayor Akipelu, and Emeka Madunagu. So if you're ready, let the hangout start now. Nigeria and the United States of America are close in some ways. Both countries practice the presidential system of government, which vests power in the president. Incidentally, both current presidents are contemporaries. They are in their 70s. But what? that is where it ends. While President Trump is loquacious and always cutting controversy with unguarded comments, his Nigerian counterpart is taciturn rarely speaking even in the face of provocation. On Monday, the American number one citizen <coughs> was alleged to have referred to President Buhari as lifeless after a Washington meeting. He, he has come under widespread attack for that uncharitable comments. Well, Babajide, I thought we were going to... Looking at this, it is not confirmed yet, but we are quoting the Financial Times that actually said, attributed the story to one of his aides. Three, of, three, uh, aides. three, three aides. aides of um, President Donald Trump. Yeah. <coughs> what is the implication of saying that he doesn't, next time, he doesn't want to meet with this lifeless president? Mm. Um. President, Bush, uh, President uh, Trump, at the last count, has abused 487 persons, institutions, and countries. He has abused world leaders. He has ridiculed American heroes. So if he actually said those uh, um, things about uh, our president, honestly, I won't be surprised because I know he's capable of saying those things. Remember when he made the shithole comment? Mm, calling he, our country he, shithole. He actually denied. He denied it. He denied. But there were people around him at the time who actually uh, had him make those remarks. World leaders sometimes uh, make these kind of mistakes. Remember when the former Ghanaian um, um, president called Nigeria, um, I did describe what he said, some countries are just big for nothing. That's Jerry Rollins. And when he was confronted, he said, oh, I was just rapping. You were just rapping and you called Nigeria big for nothing. And uh, Cameron called Nigeria fantastically, fantastically corrupt. corrupt. <laughs> Cameron didn't know that um, <laughs> the, 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 the <laughs> mic was on. So there are things that people will say when they think that the media uh, is not present, that if they have an I mean, if they, they were in a place full of media people, they will not say it. But Buhari appears to be in good company because when you look at people that he has insulted, John Brown, Kim Jong-un, uh, uh, Ben Carson, even the late John McCain, an mm. American he hero. Said, Trump should not come for Look at what he said. About, he said, he's not a war hero. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people who weren't captured. That's how <coughs> he has ridiculed Bob, uh, McCain's uh, contributions, you know, during the Vietnam War. Here is somebody who did not fight, ridiculing a man who put his life on the line. But the, the aircraft was shot. So th this is Trump for you. Trump, this is the way he talks. So, and in my view, we Oops. don't we don't have to uh, bother ourselves so much because even the, 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 the statement is fallacious. A person 
lifeless is the absence of living. A person who is lifeless is not alive. And you cannot say that this president is lifeless. He may not be the swashbuckling kind of person that you expect to see, but that's his nature. But everyone also knows that when he wants to do something, he does it with conviction and he can be very, uh, very stubborn. Hmm. So this is not a lifeless president. People should not bother themselves about uh, what he has said. In any case, it's a rumor. Because we are not there, he, has, he knows that nobody recorded him saying that. So he can even deny it. So it doesn't affect our relationship with America. <laughs> Trump has tried to bring this, uh, bring our president closer to him. What uh, even a black president denied America, mm. uh, denied Nigeria, Trump has, has, has given to us. So I don't think uh, this is such it's a, a big, big deal. deal. Right? Mm. It will just end up like one of those things. America, yeah. let me put you on the spot here. Apparently, the People's Democratic Party actually said, they came yesterday to, you know, they said, look, we may justified by the comment of Trump that the president is just junketing around the world, that he doesn't have substance, this, that. And when I read this, I was like, are you kidding me? So this has even further divided us. But some Nigerians are quick to, you know, take side with Donald Trump that, yes, we are confirming this. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I concede to every side their right to the way they choose to react to any issue. So long as it's within the <coughs> confines of the law. But you see, basically, I think what PDP was trying to say, I don't speak for them, I don't work for them. What they were trying to say <coughs> was that they were trying to accuse the president of going on junketing, a global junket seeking relevance because of a second term. Well, all that is in the realm of politics. But I'll look at the entire issue this way. You know, um, of course, the, pres the person who met with Trump was President Muhammad Buhari. A human being. So I, I believe that Trump was using diplomatic diplomaties. Now, what was he trying to convey? Was there a problem about it? During their meeting, were there certain things he asked President Buhari that he wasn't convinced about the answer? Or were there certain things he was trying to push? And then President Buhari didn't give him a commitment. You know, I think we need to hear from the Nigerian delegation, maybe Nigerian embassy people who were part of the meeting, what were the things that, you know, constituted the discussions, that were part of the discussions? I mean, I'm taking it further from what GD talked about. Yes, Trump, we know, you know, is a loose cannon. But again, we, would, we, sh we should not throw away whatever may have been the intent of such a remark. Why? Because these things help us in shaping and reshaping of our foreign policy in the way we engage. Like he said, that, America and Nigeria remain good development partners. But again, we must always prepare for eventualities. Don't forget, if you remember when Obasanjo was the president, <coughs> I think he sacked a minister of state on the spot at, his, at the ceremony of his sign, at the signing ceremony. There was an agreement that was to be signed. And I think the ceremony was not put together properly. I think George Soros was around or so, you know, for that um, event. And then, I think because of shoddy preparations also, after the event, he announced the sacking of the minister. So, what I would like to say is this. We must continuously, you know, continually engage, we must continually engage our development partners. <laughs> then we must always also, knowing the kind of person Trump is, we must always also be ready to deal with eventualities, things that arise from such meetings. Yeah. Because he's the president of the strongest man in the world, because I mean, the strongest man in the world, the strongest country in the world, the biggest, as in the most powerful country in the world, so to say, does he give you liberty to, does that give you liberty to let, uh, let me dress saying, down, Mr. President? Let me start by saying that the story was carried by Financial Times. I consider that Financial Times is a credible journal. <coughs> but all of us as professionals know that as a journalist, you are as good as your source. Mm -hmm. If your source is wrong, then you are wrong. Yeah, wrong. Yeah. It is easy for somebody that wants to do mischief or wants to insult our president 
to drop that story in the name of being a source in Financial Times and it will get published because it was not attributed to anybody. It was just attributed as a gossip or side talks. So as far as I'm concerned, the story may not even exist. But in case President Trump said that, two reasons. One, like Jude said, I don't need to, Jude has spoken extensively about how loose President Trump is when it comes to referring to people. Secondly, is a liar who, who lies habitually. So if they ask him, yes, I mean, there are facts. There are fast checks that have been done, and he has lied more than any other president that ever ruled America. He, he's lying is second nature to him, and he changes his story as by the enters out. Three, is the president that has brought the office of the president of the United States to disrepute. He, 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 he does things that people are amazed that it could happen in America, but that's the beauty of democracy. That's the people, they are, they, that's the person they people America they voted for. said they wanted, yes. So, and every, every, uh, the, every group of it. people get the government they deserve. So mm -hmm. that is because deep down, a lot of Americans are racist. A lot of Americans don't really believe in, 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 in immigrants. That's the reality. Sometimes they may change or do things. So there are a lot of people that have been, that have been, that have been there but they will not be able to get a voice. And um, Pre uh, President Trump was able to tap into it and give them a voice, those who have always wanted him to be like that. But having said that, I think one of the reasons, if you said that, might be the fact that he did not get what he wanted. Uh -huh. He invited President, you know, President, President Mohamed Buhari is the first <laughs> person that he invited. It is not because he likes Buhari, but because of China's incursion into Africa and the importance in Nigeria within the economic space in Africa, there is need to try to convince us not to go the way of China. The way of China. Yeah. So he, they wanted to get him. Uh -huh. Second, they were having problems because of the trade wars that he was having with everybody. The farmers in America started having problems to sell their produce. In fact, right now, the American government has to subsidize them again substantially because, because of these trade wars and the, and, and, and the tariffs and the counter tariffs that they are putting on, on, on imports from, from US, especially in China. Now, the, 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 the farmers in America need a forum where to, to sell. So he wanted us to start getting farm produce from America, especially rice, mm -hmm. which is not in our interest because one of the things that this government has done, one of the joint revolution, to is to invest extensively in rice cultivation. So it's not possible for us for us to go back to the days where we used to eat Uncle Ben's and Auntie <laughs> Caroline. It cannot work. <laughs> so because he didn't get what he wanted, in mm. his usual cavalier way of doing things, mm -hmm. yes, it's not impossible that I might insult the president, yeah. but every Nigerian should feel that's why I would never agree with PDP. Yes, we may play politics, but every Nigeria should feel insulted because whether we like it or not, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is the symbol of our sovereignty. And for anybody to insult him, he has insulted all Nigerians. That, 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 is, um, that would be music to the ears of the PDP. Because <laughs> when Jonathan was there, there was no name that they didn't, they didn't call, call him. him. Some of us said, look, let this office be respected. It could be your own father tomorrow, it could be your own brother. But you know, the way, the way we are in Nigeria, everything about us is self-interest. Yes. If, if someone does not belong to your party, you don't want to see anything good in him. You want everyone to believe that, oh, everyone in PDP is an animal. Everyone in the APC is an animal. So for them, during Jonathan's time, they called him a drunken sailor. They called him in in a clueless. They called him ineffectual <laughs> buffoon. That was nothing they didn't call this man. And as long as those PDP guys are there now, every attempt to ridicule Buhari will be something that puts them in raptures. Will be something that will make them excited. So this is the thing. If for for the for for perspective that or the fact that. Is an outsider for neutrals. For neutrals. Neutrals. Because politics is, has a way of making us to put patriotism aside. Mm. That is a fact in our mm. country. For neutrals mm. and patriots, they will see what Trump said, if indeed he said it, as an affront on our country. They will see it as a disgrace. On, I mean, as an insult on our country. 
But the people that I'm talking about, the die-hard partisan PDP people who cast their minds back to all those things they said about Jonathan, and as far as they are concerned, if this thing happens 10 times, their reaction will be the same, <laughs> which will be to try. You can see what our friend, the uh, color all over the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I ask and I say, you don't need some of this, some of this, some of the, even the responses you don't need. But I can't tell him how to do his job because he will point out what the APC did to him during the attack. Pass. We have to move on. <laughs> okay. Still to come. Lawyers, others challenge Buhari's remark on the rule of law. Stay with us. Welcome back. The debate over which should take preeminence in governance between the rule of law and national security has raged for centuries. Nigeria's President Mamadou Buhari on Monday reignited the arguments when he stated that the national security should not be sacrificed for the rule of law. In, his, in an address presented at a conference of the Nigerian Bar Association MBA in Abuja on Monday, President Buhari had vowed to put national security and interest above the rule of law. But he has been challenged by eminent Nigerians. They say rather the rule of law should be the very foundation which national interest stands. <laughs> this is tricky, Babajiji. Yes, it is. Um, I am particularly worried about the possibility of misuse of the opportunity to exercise power arbitrarily. You see, the president is the, is the president of everyone, is the leader in our country. In his position, he can put anyone in the slammer for as long as he wants. That is if he thinks that, oh, it's in, it is in the uh, so national, national interest, interest to do this. So my own worry is, if we continue along this path, we won't know when to stop. We are talking about the Asuki today. We are talking about um, 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 Zagzaki. Both of them have been released, released by the courts. But we are holding on to them and citing national interest. The danger in that time, and in this is that it's subject to abuse. We could also say, OK, for even governors who have immunity, we could suddenly say, oh, it is in the national interest to do this in this state. Immunity aside. To brush aside immunity and do certain things. We, when we start something, we have to be careful. That is my worry. Because I know that in our country, we are used to abusing privilege. So when the president, first, I even disagree with him going before lawyers to talk about that. This are, you don't have to announce that this is what you want to do, if you think that keeping someone in the slammer is in national interest, you go ahead and do your thing. You don't need to go and face lawyers, and put it in the speech, and be rubbing it in that, look, you have to do this. Already people are not happy that decisions, some of the decisions of our courts are not being obeyed. And it's not limited to the federal level. We have governors refusing to obey decisions of the court. Mm. If we continue along that path, then we are, we are, we are, we are, we are winking at anarchy. Mm. That is what no one wants to see because you will now, you won't be able to tell what <coughs> judgment of, uh, of, of, of the court that a government will, 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 will choose to, to obey. So it's true that even in America, national interest uh, can sometimes take preeminence over uh, human rights. For example, even the killing, the extrajudicial killing of Osama bin Laden. Mm. You know, naturally, mm. the person who ordered the killing shouldn't order the killing of anyone. But in America, it's seen as the right thing to do. You go to another country to, I mean, to take someone's life 
and then went and buried that person at sea. And the law, I mean, the, the people do not see anything wrong about that. That is not all. This same law courts in America have passed judgment that Guantanamo Bay should be shot. Should be shot. But the government has refused to, 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 to do that. So there are times, too, when national interest conflicts with human mm -hmm. rights, and then the, 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 uh, the Americans, the fathers of democracy currently, will say, no, we would rather go for national interest. But we have to uh, be careful mm -hmm. to not abuse this and walk into uh, anarchy. Emeka, yeah. some people will say, can't the, the federal government confide in, maybe, let's say, the judiciary? Let me say, I, somebody is about to be held in communicado for a long time, and they want to sort out some things that the person might be working with a terrorist organization and everything, and I just called maybe the CJN or the judge and share intelligence and look for national interest. Mm -hmm. This person is not meant to be released and everything. So, you know, so that you can, everybody, the two arms of government can be on the same page with yeah. that. Yeah. But not in work, uh, working, uh, you know, at cross purposes in the situation whereby Sambo Dansuki, different courts, the land. Like the last time I checked, I think that was like the fifth yeah, time. I, mean, I think the sixth. Mm, that they've said, look, it you can be, yeah, it you be giving free. bail. Yeah. But the federal government, in the best of their knowledge, the national interest, the same national interest. They refuse to fail. If, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, let him go. Yeah, like what you're saying exists. After all, that's why you see sometimes judges will ask counsel on both sides to meet with them in chambers, you know, so to sort things out. If you look at our anti-terrorism law, even the amended version, they, even the um, administration of uh, criminal, criminal justice, justice a, ACJ, mm, our I laws understand. contain enough provisions to deal with different challenges. Of course. We have been fine-tuning our laws to meet up with uh, current challenges and global best practices. But the issue is this. I remember some years ago, I don't know whether it was under Yara Dua or Basunjo or Jonathan, where I think the Minister of Justice warned different operatives of government. He said they were piling up judgment debts for the federal government and that the bill was getting high. So he said they should be careful about the actions they take on behalf of the federal government, because there are implications for these things. If you go to the Federal Ministry of Justice, go and find out. John, a journalist, John Sabiri, has just sued the federal government for 200 million for unlawful detention. Now that matter is going to go to court. And if he wins, that adds to the bill. So again, a court some days ago said um, the Nigerian army should pay some, I think 11 detainees, 11 million for illegal detention. I understand, I, 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 I'm, you know, that, that that is another, that is an addition to the bill. So you see, in framing some of these things, we should look at the pros and the cons. We should look at both sides. It may, when you talk about national interest, it's not difficult for you to, you know, for us <coughs> as citizens to expect that government should, yes, should, as a matter of fact, defend national interest. That government should, as a matter of fact, you know, defend national security. But again, there must be parameters within which this thing should exist. And don't forget, it's, it's not a very fine line. But you must never give a blank check to operatives of government. Otherwise, a policeman can slap somebody at the checkpoint and say it was a national interest, it was national security. And the man goes to court and is able to prove that it was impunity that you infringed on his rights. And the court grants him a huge, um, a, a, um, Huge damages. What are you going to do? Who is going to? Is the policeman going to come and pay damages? It's the government. So we must be very careful about yeah. those things. Um, the case of Asari Dokubo, um, it was Festus Kiyamu that was his lawyer and went as far as the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually freed Asari Dokubo. But the federal government was holding Asari Dokubo that time, you know, because of national interest. You know, this um, Niger Delta struggle and everything, and they claim that in the national interest. That's why they are detaining Asari Dokubo. And Festus Kiyamo actually went as far as the Supreme Court claiming the violation of his fundamental human rights. And the Supreme Court actually ruled that, look, that his human rights has been violated and he was actually, you know, set free. 
Yes, um, let me start by saying that what is national security and who determines what national security is? If we say we are going to, if we, are, we, have, to, we have to be sincere with ourselves, the form of government we want to practice. If you say we want to practice democracy, then the foundation of democracy is the rule of law. Hmm. If, you, if you ignore it, then you are, you are trying to destroy the system of government that you are practicing. And I will never support a situation where the national security will supersede this rule of law. Why? Because that is the road to dictatorship. If we decide that we want to run in democracy, and it, the foundation of that democracy is the rule of law, then we must abide by the decision of the court. If national interest is involved, what I expect the government to do is if you take, if you take like the National Security Advisor to court, you can ask the court that because of national interest, that case should be heard in camera. camera. Mm -hmm. And when it is heard in camera, mm -hmm. you, pr you, you present facts that the judge will see that it is not in the national interest to release that, that um, accused. That is how to do it. But if you just decide that, you may say we should give this guy a bail, but because of natural interest, we're not going to do that. Yes, you can be lucky when you have a president that wants to play by the rules. If you have a president that has tendencies for dictatorship, then his own personal interest will become the national interest. We have seen that all over the world, dictators. That is how they behave. Yes. Because immediately, immediately they become a dictator. Mm. Their own personal <coughs> interest becomes a national interest. Yes, they so become we, the state. Yeah. So how we chant in their yeah, they become the state. So it if you do something that I don't like, I will now arrest you and tell you that you are being kept because of national interest. So I will never accept that. I think whoever wrote that speech for the president is not doing service to the democracy that we are practicing. Mm. And we must not make, we must not equate interests of a group or personal interest as national interest. Hmm. The um, um, Amnesty International, they will always release their reports, let's say, on how our soldiers are dealing with Boko Haram, this uh, Boko Haram uh, terrorists, hmm. and maybe at the point in time, maybe in battleground, you know, they have their rules of engagement and everything, yeah. and that soldiers are dealing fatally with them hmm. and they're killing them. And but Amnesty International, anytime they want to write their report, mm. they still see some of this treatment given to the Boko Haram guys as violation of fundamental human rights. Uh, yes, because if the there are rules governing governing combat, you for example I raise a white flag, it means that I want to surrender. You have no right to take my life afterwards. Hmm. If I willingly surrender. It's against the Geneva Convention for you to now take my life. And the terrorists have um, uh, detonated oh, bombs to we, kill thousands of people. This is a war. Okay. This is a war. Today, well, what you are talking war. about, okay. it, it, a war is a war. It, we are the ones defining it. <laughs> the people who are waging a war against us, they know that they are at war. Our country is at war. They are taking territories. They are taking prisoners. Leah Sharibu, for example, they've taken her more like a prisoner. Mm. They are, if they've even taken her soldiers prisoners in the past. So it's a war. Just as General Danjuma said back then to Jonathan. He said, we it's are at war. war. Yeah, it's a war. That's why they are taking your territories. So a, a war is a war. Today, the Nigerian army is saying that, look, we are educating our soldiers on the rules of engagement on international best practices. So some of those things that they used to do, the irresponsible things that they used to do, mm. they are no longer doing them. And they are putting, they are putting soldiers on trial for even killing, killing uh, Boko Haram uh, detainees. They are putting them on trial. We are trying to show the world now that we are cleaning up our, uh, our acts that we are not doing those things that we used to do. Remember during the battle for Giwa Barracks, mm. the terrorists that who escaped from the, uh, from the uh, det uh, detention facility inside Giwa Barracks, that 
civilian JTF arrested. Our soldiers opened fire on them. And they were not less than 70. People, so there is nowhere in the world where that is permitted. The, as in the Boko Haram guys? They were detained okay. inside Giwa Barracks. Okay. Then Boko Haram invaded Giwa Barracks, set free their people. Okay. Then the Air Force stormed the area mm. and saved our face. Once the table turned and civilian JTF began to arrest these guys one after another, then they gathered them somewhere and shot them. There's a video of that act. And that was why the Amnesty International turned against the army. And it worked against us during uh, Clinton's time. I mean, I said Clinton, during Obama's, Obama's time. time. Yeah. Because there were American lawmakers who were saying, mm, look, really if long. you buy these weapons, if you let Nigeria buy these weapons, they will turn the weapons on the, on, uh, the, the, uh, the civilians. They will use it against their own people. Look, there are many orphans today, many orphans today in Maiduguri who are victims of extrajudicial killing by the military. And for some of them, they had no cause but to go and join Boko Haram. This is, this is the truth. So you are not allowed to take people's life. If they are Boko Haram terrorists, arrest them. You can even, you, you can get them to give up this uh, needless killing of innocent people. And we are doing that now. Or to radicalize them. Yeah. We are doing that now. Yes, that's the radicalization. Mm -hmm. We are doing that now. Some of them, are even helping to provide information about locations of their leaders and all that. You don't have to kill people because, oh, they are engaged in a war with you. Once someone gives up, you see what, how America does it in Afghanistan. They will use a plane to drop leaflets, warning these people that, look, we, we can kill all of you, but we don't want to kill you. Mm. This is your opportunity to surrender. So once they see the leaflets written in their language and they read it, they will make up their mind, okay, we are surrendering. Once they surrender, they will take them to a facility, and the de-radicalization can begin. There can be no justification for extrajudicial killing, either by SARS. Look at SARS. Even at a time when we are talking about uh, 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 cleaning SARS up, they are still killing people in the war. You see SARS operative, hardened murderers, they are still killing people in the war. They are still misbehaving all over the place. So it can, it's not permitted. So the, my own concern is, we can't have a situation in which the courts will be giving pronouncements and we won't obey. Or we will be cherry picking the ones that we want to obey. That is where I'm going. Yes, I, I, I agree that national interest is very important, it's paramount. It takes precedence over the rights of a person because the Supreme Court itself said where the security of the country is threatened by the actions of the individual, then the rights of that individual can be taken away. It's already, there's already a yes, judicial a pronouncement yes. on that. Yes. Hmm. So the president is right in a way, but the occasion that he chose... The right of is an what, individual is different from the rule of law. Hmm? The right of an individual... The rule of law is, is, is the different way the law. message is couched. I know where yeah. it's going because we, when we are talking, he is trying to justify keeping Dasuki and... Uh, exactly. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, and those are individuals. Yes, that. You see, that, those are the reasons, those guys who are the reasons why he said those things. He's just trying to justify why, why everyone expected that Dasuki had that final appearance in court by the Supreme Court will be released. But they are holding on to him. So he's trying to justify that. That's why he went to that place to say that. So these things <laughs> bring needless <laughs> controversy and all that. Yeah, for me, basically, um, if we have chosen democracy, and we are signatories to international treaties on human rights. Of course, we should, we should submit and subject ourselves to the dictates of the law. Because you see, some people might say, okay, for partisan reasons, the president is right. Don't worry until the day a policeman assaults you at the checkpoint. <laughs> then you will know that. And you can't enforce your rights. You can't enforce your rights. So what the thing is, this is not about saying that um, we should allow a free reign. But again, if you have a reason, you know, the Attorney General of the Federation said uh, that Suki's actions led to the death of several people. But you are one side, prosecution. That Suki has a defense. Mm -hmm. Take it to court. It's not by issuing press statements. He has not been know, jailed. Press statements, and then you now want to force the fight accompli on the court. Mm -hmm. 
So I feel the federal government should submit itself to the rule of law. Yeah. There is no, there is no, sh there is no middle ground. There is I, no I agree the rule you. of law. I agree. Yeah, on my own, um, I agree that there are, uh, there are rules of engagement in war. But I also believe that all is fair in war. I can understand why some of our soldiers misbehave. It is not justified, but I can understand why they misbehave. Because if you are soldiers and you have seen your colleagues or your, maybe your commander killed and you arrested people and detained them and one way or the other, they escape and come back again and kill more people. When next you see such soldiers, you want to kill them. Because that is why SARS became a murder gang. Because they will arrest armed robbers, put armed robbers to detention, they will escape and come back and kill more, more policemen. <laughs> All right, we have to move on. And now, the continued incarceration of Leo Sharibo, the only abducted Dapchi schoolgirl yet to be freed, is becoming a ding dong affair. Now, the horror she has endured in the hands of the abductors since February is unimaginable. But like a lone voice in the wilderness, poor Leah has cried out for help. In an audio clip released on Monday, the 15-year-old Leah begged for help, asking government and President Muhammadu Buhari to rescue her from her abductors. After about six months in captivity, who will heed her call and bring her home? Meanwhile, let us hear from Leah and her father. I am Leah Sharibu, the girl that was abducted in GGSS Dapchi. I am calling on the government and people of goodwill to intervene to get me out of my current situation. I also plead to the members of the public to help my mother, my father, my younger brothers and relatives. Kindly help me out of my predicament. I am begging you to treat me with compassion. I am calling on the government, particularly the president, to pity me and get me out of this serious situation. Thank you. Now go with you. I'm Leah's father. I'm Mr. Sharibu Natam. Is I confirm that this is Leah's voice, and even the picture is confirmed that it's Leah. I just pleaded that the federal government will act on her behalf to see that this girl has been released. No any other governmental organization have ever contacted me since this girl was abducted on 19 February. I'm urging the government to put pressure and effort. To see this girl has been released. I'm pleading and begging them so that they can do their possible best as the way they release the others, 104 girls. They, they need to do the same to see this girl has been released too. Please, I'm begging, I'm crying. Well, um, that's Leah Sharibo, 15 year old. She's a Christian. She professed to be a Christian and they wanted to her to profess uh, Islam and she refused and on that basis out of the uh, number of the girls that were abducted they said if she has refused to become a Christian uh, maybe a, to Muslim. Turn from, um, a Muslim they won't allow you know mm. very sensitive thing I think these terrorists are trying to play on our you know religious belief and everything but she's still alive that yes. voice is a confirmation and from my father's yes, That's good news. And remember that uh, Aja Aisha was killed had, uh, about a month ago, uh, told Nigerians that Leah Sharibu was alive uh, and well, and that um, government should do whatever it takes to get out of, get out of uh, captivity. And that's the appeal that we are making. Uh, these terrorists know what they are doing. When it looks like nobody is talking about a big time captive in their hands. They will send out this kind of message. Remember the University of Maiduguri lecturers? lecturers yes. You know? They actually did something like this. They, 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 for a long time, people stopped talking about them. We, you know, we are Nigerians now. Something else will be occupy our consciousness. Mm. We will not even remember that Leah Sharibu is somewhere. So that happened. The women, the uh, wives of police officers that were arrest, that were abducted on um, on the highway, on Dambua Highway, they were going for I think a wedding or so, and then they were abducted. It was the same thing. They showed them 
They showed them crying and asking the president to do something uh, to free them, this and that. And it worked. Because in the end, we, we negotiated with them and got those people freed. Those uh, lecturers too, this was what happened. So Leah Sharibu can thank God that she's alive. After all, there were some of our colleagues who died in the stampede on that day. You know, they died. And they didn't even bring back their corpses. They died in the hands of the terrorists. Yet they didn't bring back, they didn't uh, return their corpses to their families. Mm. That one is a permanent pain. It's mm. a permanent scar for the parents of those ones. Mm. So she's, she's lucky to be alive. And all we can do at this level is encourage our government to do whatever it can. After all, Israel, just for one of his soldiers, Shalit, exchange 1,000 Hamas fighters hmm. for just one Israeli soldier. And America too would do anything to save the yeah, life of yes. any of their soldiers in captivity. Yes. They'll Begad. do that. Hmm. So let them do whatever oh, nice. it takes. As long as, yes, every, people rejoiced when they brought back those guests, those Dabchi guests. But our joy cannot be full. Hmm. As it's, long as this girl yeah. has become uh, the soul of the nation. Mm. Yeah. As long as she's where, she's the conscience of the nation, I mean. As long as she's where she is, it will continue to prick our conscience that we need to do whatever it takes to bring her Ibiga, she professed, uh, she did, she refused to profess other religion. And I remember where the Bible says, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness yeah. sake, you know. Yeah. And for this now, if they're going to, what mm. the terrorists are asking for, I think they want to get something for them to stage this audio message. Of course, that for of course that's why they mm. are terrorists. If they were in terrorists, they would not capture people and keep them somewhere, then <coughs> be making um, demands. It's um, really unfortunate that um, a little girl like that has found herself that in the middle of, of um, such. Else. Politics. Well, you can call them animals or anything, but again, we need to engage them so that the girl will regain her freedom. Yes, the DSS will be used to uh, uh, this, uh, find out whether this is actually uh, the, um, authentic. Uh, Leah Sharibu's uh, voice. Uh, well, the father, the father, you don't the need. Father has... <laughs> it's the father who can authenticate. <laughs> the DSS didn't have direct contact with her, so how can they authenticate voice? We see with the kind of some of the statements that we we'll read sometimes we we'll just sit back and wonder what's <laughs> happening. So the father has said this is my daughter's daughter. voice. The father has said this is my daughter's picture, where she was sitting on that mat. So go and do your best to have this Probably guy released. Is. And I think also the Nigerian media has that obligation. The it same way from some of us continue to talk about Zamfara until they went there to save people's lives. We must continue to talk about this innocent girl's life. Otherwise, young people, some of them will feel they will cause the day they were born as Nigerians. If we can't protect people, we must protect our people. Uh, protect our communities from these uh, Boko Haram people raiding communities looking for who to kidnap. Emeka, when you want to look at it, we still have the first batch of um, Chibo girls. They are still in captivity. Mm, yeah, it's unfortunate. That's another sad Though some of them are that's suffering another from sad, of them. Uh, that's another uh, sad reminder of um this uh, terrible Boko Haram war uh, uh, it's 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 a big picture actually different people, years now? different people's yeah, lives I think that's yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah mm -hmm. the lives of a lot of people have been disrupted but you see we must continue to fight to get uh, to make our nation more secure we cannot we, we cannot leave the war to the terrorists to win. No, we must continue to fight. Mayor, the primary duty of government is to protect life and properties. So, if we must not leave anybody behind, if we have a young girl that's in captivity, it is the duty of government to do everything possible to get her out. Whatever it takes to get her out, we should do that. But you know, not forgetting that there are some people, they are not dapty girls, they are not... Um, Chibok girls, 
they, 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 just, just, they were they just were abducted just, um, randomly. Yeah, yeah. Random, we hear stories yes. about uh, soldiers sure. free, 700, 800 mm -hmm. from the capti uh, captivity of Boko Haram. They are still there. We don't have, we don't have an um, ID card. We don't have uh, any kind of identity identification to actually show that these people are missing. But they're actually missing. What about asylum seekers hmm? that, that they were they, deported they, by the is Boko Haram, when Boko Haram attacks the community, they first look for your food. They want to steal your food. They want to, to take women away. Women are prized yeah. uh, um, possessions okay. in their hands because those women will cook for them what on the war front. Yeah. You know? Then they also think that as part of dominating their environment, people's wives that they have appropriated can now be shared to the, their fighters. People so you see, yes, yes now, yes, <laughs> yeah. you see them, forcefully. some of those people have, have been married forcefully to those, those fighters. Okay. Sometimes they truly fall in love, as we've seen, and those guys who, even when you rescue them, they go back mm. to, the, to, to the bush. Some to of the girls, those they don't want to come back. Yeah. So, so now, that is why you have many people in their hands. Women, they don't, they, they, sometimes when they raid the community, the elderly people, those who are, who are quarter to die, they leave them alone. But young people, they can conscript them, force them to fight on their side. Then women, they can take them because they are going to use some of them as a, it's just the same thing that ISIS was doing in uh, Iraq. So radicalizing. All those uh, 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 young women, uh, that they, they 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 abducted in those communities. So that's the main Christian community. Yeah, in, in, uh, what was the place? The, uh, Nineveh. Yeah. All yeah, those. Yeah, uh, yeah. Nineveh. Yeah. They made them. They, they were forced to marry some of the ISIS fighters. So this is the way these people think. So wherever we we will continue to rescue people because the truth is, in the urban centers, they are not in control. But in the hinterland. You are going to see a story that uh, Dalat did about Pulka. You will hear the people say, if we venture one kilometer out of our town, we'll fall into the hands of Boko Haram. One kilometer? Yes, you see the story on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So they are still uh, 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 literally controlling some communities in our, in our land. Yes. I want to thank you so much. Um, Mayor Akukwalu, welcome back thank from you. that vacation. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Emeka Madunago, thank you for thank coming. You much. Thank and you. the Mestro Babajide Koladi Otsutaju, thank you for always being there for us. My own, <laughs> my own <laughs> vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it on Journalist Hangout. Join us tomorrow for another interesting episode of the program. You can also watch Journalist Hangout on our platforms showing on the screen. We're also on YouTube, youtube.com slash TBC News Nigeria. Our feedback channel is Journalist Hangout at tbcnews.tv. I'm Ayadevi Ozubakon. See you later. God bless Nigeria.